大家晚上好，欢迎大家来到国际培训大咖五十谈，我是顾立民。上一期我们非常非常非常荣幸的请到了国际非常著名的 Dr. Richard Swanson 啊，就是 Dick Swanson 啊，就是斯旺森教授，他也是明尼苏达大学的教授，他非常非常的著名，因为他是国际上人力资源发展。这个领域或者这个学科的重要的创始人之一，那么他从六十年代呢就非常的有名了，他今年已经八十多岁了。那么上一次的访谈的话呢，我们一共访谈了一个小时十分钟左右的时间，在这期间呢，我们询问他了著名的人力资源基础的一些问题，包括著名的人力资源啊三角凳啊，呃，还有呢其他的。一些个关于人力资源发展这个领域，或者叫人力资源开发这个领域未来的发展的方向性的问题等等。同时呢，我们也借上次访谈的机会呢，呃，也是向大咖致敬，并且呢，在最后的话呢，我还小小的激动了一下啊，非常的不好意思。但是呢，呃，斯旺森教授也是对啊，也是非常的这个肯定啊。那么再次感谢 Dr. Dick Swanson 教授，多年以来，半个多世纪以来，对我们。领域的贡献，特别是对人力资源发展啊，就是培训是人力资源发展当中最大的一个分支。多年来做出的贡献，感谢您为我们这个领域创造了很多的价值，特别是建立了这个学科，创造了这个学科，创造了这个专业，创造了这个领域，让我们这么多的人能够为企业发展、为社会、为各自的国家的社会的发展做出了长久的贡献。而且呢，未来的发展是越来越看好这个领域发展，越来越深越深厚。那么，呃，未来的前景呢，也越来的越宽广。祝您身体健康。那么，未来我们一定还会请您来向呃向我们进行分享。谢谢。那么，今天晚上我们再次的换档啊，请一些个非常著名的，也是非常优秀的实践者。啊，一线的实践者来给我们分享。那么今天晚上呢，是著名的 Don Clark、Donald Clark、唐纳德·克拉克。那么唐纳德·克拉克呢，他是在英国。那么他是非常著名的 e-learning 以及学习科学方面的专家。他最著名的呃一个演讲呢，也是一个 TED 演讲，是在 YouTube 上面，是用花了二十五分钟的时间，给大家隶属了两千五百年以来学习科学发展的历史。那么隶属了很多我们耳熟能详的大家。那么今天晚上呢，我们也请他给我们做一个两千二十五分钟讲解了两千五百年学以来学习的历史啊。所所以呢，今天晚上呢，请大家呃注意注意观看，拿好笔啊，甚至呢可以去回看。所以，那么我们闲话少叙，下面我们隆重请出来自英国的 Don Clark。Hi Donald, how are you? Very well. Very well from here in Brighton in England. Great, great, great.、Uh, tell us、uh, how how's the weather there. It is as usual in England, a bit rainy, but、uh, that's not unusual for me because I'm actually from Scotland. That it's a bit like Beijing in、uh, China in the in the north. So I'm、uh -huh. quite used to the rain, even though this is as far south in England as you can get uh, uh, on the beach south of London. Yeah. How far are you from?、Uh, how far away you are from? From are you from London? Oh, in London, it's about fifty minutes by train. It's quite、oh, close. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, it's quite close. Quite close. I I look up on Google Earth. It's beautiful country. It's a lot of greens over there. Yeah, it's a very green place. I, I, I'm、yeah, living on the、it. sea. I like I like living by the sea. You know, that's、uh, great. Great. First of all, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be on the Training Master Series. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And.、Uh, Uh, we haven't met,、uh, but I have heard you so many times, and、uh, well, thanks to the pandemic, <laughs> and、yeah. uh, we, I got the opportunity and、uh, to read a lot of your blogs and your works. And, but not everybody knows about you, so for just for audience,、uh, would you please introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, what you studied, and where tell us where you live and work now. Sure. Yeah. Well. Let's go back. I, I'll keep this short. You know, I'm a, I'm not a young man, so it could be a long story. But、uh, going back, so、young. I studied. I come from Scotland, and、uh, I studied at the University of Edinburgh. I have a degree in philosophy,、okay. which made me unemployable when I left college. Really, which is why I went into business. <laughs> 
I also studied at an Ivy League college in the US called Dartmouth College uh, in New Hampshire yeah. in philosophy again. But it was a formative experience really because Dartmouth College was where the modern era of artificial intelligence started, a very famous conference. And so really? that's where I picked up uh, some computing skills. This is way back in the day when I was a young man and they had a big mainframe on the campus. They were quite forward thinking. So that, that was my so educational background. Uh, and then, uh, like many people from my country, I moved to London and eventually mm -hmm. to Brighton. And we I almost immediately went with two other people and, and started a business. It was the very early days of technology-based training in the early 1980s. So that's 35 years ago, a long time ago. And uh, we built that business and uh, I was the chief executive. It was called Epic and we floated it on the stock market. And I, I sold it in 2005. And then uh, when I was 49, and so I had a second life really, you know, I was free from the, uh, the tyranny of employment, as they say. <laughs> I like and, that term. <laughs> yeah. And I traveled a lot, including China, but oh, you know, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, uh, Central America, America, all across Europe. So I did a lot of traveling, uh, a lot of talks at conferences. Uh, I've written a couple of books. And I have also, and more recently though, to jump to the present, I blog a lot, give a lot of talks at conferences, but I run an AI company called Wildfire that mm -hmm. uses artificial intelligence to automatically create online learning content. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a professor at the University of Derby here in England. Uh, I've done some teaching in, uh, in US universities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's me. You know, I have, I've had two lives, really. The first one was building a business. And uh, the second one was really doing what I wanted to do, you know, which is I had the complete freedom to work with who I wanted on projects I liked. I didn't have, you know, I, I, I had the choice, which is nice. And also, I didn't have to wear a suit. You know, I didn't have to do that. Thing. <laughs> monkey suit we call it right yeah yeah that, that was one of the joys you know i could uh, i had the freedom if if it, if it was a if it was what involved a suit i just avoided it it was almost like a sign that it was going to be unpleasant <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh this is great um I'm, I'm, you're, you're known for, um, uh, in the learning development field, in the, internationally, uh, you're known as Don Clark, the plan B. So tell us That's what correct, is yeah. plan B? So what is plan B? And, oh, well, I suppose plan uh, B was... Plan B? Why yeah, plan, plan B? Is there a plan A? That's a natural question. So. Well, that was a good question. I, I have to say at the outset, nothing in my life was ever planned, you know? <laughs> hey, okay. but. Uh, yeah. Plan A was as I described. Plan A, you know, I, I built a business, sold it, uh, gave myself some freedom. I suppose Plan B was the mm -hmm. second life I had, really, which was uh -huh. when I sold my business, I started blogging and called the blog Plan, plan B. Yeah. And yeah. so all Plan B is, I've defined Plan B as not Plan A. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I was de determined uh, when I was 49 and I, you know, I had the freedom to do things, I was determined to do things differently. And that right. was why I called it Plan B. So the cutoff is when you, the cutoff between Plan A and the first life and the pr not the current life and the previous life. <laughs> yeah, that's is right. The cutoff the is, a, is, is, is the financial uh, uh, independence. I mean, the, the yeah. when you sold the company. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I suppose also, I could arguably say I'm in Plan C now because for the last four to five years, I've focused uh -huh. a lot on artificial intelligence and learning, you know, so that's been a, that's ah. been a, it's good to change in life, you know, and not get stuck. And uh, so my focus, uh, uh, you know, I've invested in artificial intelligence companies. I've built a company myself called Wildfire. I've written a book uh, here called Artificial Intelligence for Learning, mm -hmm. uh, which is available, that, that's on Amazon. And so, you know, I've immersed myself in that one area a lot. So you could, you could call that Plan C. Wow. And the plan C is, is more like indefinite. Yeah, I mean, uh, many I, dimensions I, on many I, fronts, uh, many dimensions, right? Yes, I mean, it's such a fascinating area. It is the technology right. of the age. You know, the, the biggest companies in China, Baidai, Tencent, so on, they're really artificial intelligence companies, you know. And similarly yeah. in the West, you know, if you look at Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they are AI companies. And so right. I've been looking at AI specifically in the field of learning, and we can chat about that today, of course.
but uh, uh, that's been my focus over the last four to five years yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. great we'll come back to that because our inter entire interview most of it are on, on the learning ai and the future so yeah. three things into one you have everything and uh <laughs> so I also, I'm so impressed on your social media, I mean, website and wildfire website everywhere. Your mugshot, I mean, your headshot is, is, is like, you know, Terminator, you know, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, half man, half your face, the other is robot. Yeah. So, so how cool is that? I mean, tell, tell us <laughs> why do you make that and what message you want to convey to the audience? Well, in a funny sort of way, it was a bit of fun, primarily, but because I had changed it, you know, I had really got some focus around artificial intelligence. Right. You know, everybody has a view of artificial intelligence as the Terminator, you know, that's the common meme, as it were, you know, of robots. Right. But of course, the truth is that artificial intelligence turned out, you know, we will, we will, we don't have robot teachers, you know, artificial intelligence is much subtler than that. You know, it's more mm -hmm. like Google, it's online, it's invisible, right. almost. Right. So it was an attempt just to give myself an identity in this new plan C, we call it mm -hmm. the artificial intelligence world. So it, right. all it was, was a bit of fun, really. That, that, that's right. it. All right. Great. Great. Uh, well, first of all, I want to start our, our content with, I watched one of your YouTube videos. I mean, I study, you know, every guest on the, on the screen I interviewed, I have spent a lot of time to study them, to study the work, to learn their methodologies and everything. And one of the fantastic presentations, I would say one of the TED style talk that right. you made for the, so the call the 25, uh, 20, no, uh, 2,500 years of learning theory in 25 minutes. So you made that, fantastic presentation can you do that for us or it just like yeah, in sure, 10 minutes yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah, it just, does, how, mu yeah. how much time it does it whatever it takes so just okay go ahead. i'll try i'll try and do it even quicker than that if you wish that's probably better sure 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 we, yeah, we, sure, we love that and if you have any uh screen you, you can share your screen if you want i can give you All the right. right to share the screen if you have any you know the secretaries and those you know you, when you showed the the, the 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 pictures and you know all right well uh, actually I, I i didn't prepare to do this i'll do it verbally anyway because this is sure, more like a sure. chat, and you can job, send me so. those uh, those uh, ppt later so that i can yeah. insert into our video so that our sure, audience yeah. will have more sense of that okay great yeah i'll do it. i'll try and do it quite quickly for so the, you know the 2500 years the reason i went so far back is that mm -hmm. people forget that the learning business which we're in the hand of history reaches way from the past to the present. Mm -hmm. And so I started, uh, well, let's, let's take, uh, you know, your context, you're sitting in uh, Shanghai, and right. there could be no doubt that, uh, you know, 2,500 years ago was almost exactly when Confucius lived. And right. the, hand of, the hand of Confucius philosophy, Confucian philosophy is very, a real present thing in modern day China. You know, the, the social aspect of China, it really, oh, to yeah. understand uh, Chinese culture, then Confucius would be a necessary, uh, mm -hmm. you know, influence in that sense. And even today with the nationwide examination system, there are many ancient and historical features right. of learning that still exist today. So that's in China. But if you went to the Middle East, you'd find right. a hand of Muhammad reaching out. You know, right. the Quran means recitation, and you find that recitation is a feature in the Middle East. Uh, you know, people do uh, almost learn by rote in many contexts, mm -hmm. and the religious education is a constant feature in that part of the world. And then in, right. the, in the Anglo-American, European-American context, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is uh, by and large a Christian uh, history, then you have uh, people like Jesus who, who and, and other religious figures like St. Augustine, Ignatius, Luther, Calvin, all these people. And that, that's more around storytelling. You know, Jesus, he, Jesus was a storyteller, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the sermon. And right. of course, walk into any university today and it's like the inside of a church in a lecture hall. You have the <laughs> lectern where, uh, you know, that looks like the pulpit in a church. You have the right. lecture which is just like the pews in a church. So. I started the, uh, you know, I've written on the, on my blog, you can find 110 figures and I've written two or three pages on each, which forms a book really on the history of learning. But it's important to remember that 
all our traditions and learning go way back in history, but are still with us today. Mm -hmm. And uh, another big influence, uh, of course, this is uh, my knowledge is more about the Western influences. Your influences will have been very different culturally uh, in that sense, but they converge strangely. And I'll explain why. Uh, if we then move on in history, we have, you know, we had those religious figures uh, that were quite important, but there's another really important thing in Western philosophy, and that's the Greeks. So we have right. Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. And they represent the three major strands of learning theory now anyway. You know, Socrates, he never wrote a book, never wrote a word. Everything mm -hmm. was social, in the marketplace, speaking to people. So that's still a dominant feature of learning, the social dimension. Mm -hmm. Plato and Aristotle, one was a pure rationalist in reason. And mm -hmm. Aristotle really came from a more scientific background. And still we have those two threads in learning theory. You know, we have those who believe that it's all about just their reason and telling people and mathematics and so on. And then Aristotle came from more of a scientific background. And there are many people in the learning world who believe very strongly in cognitive science as an influence. So mm -hmm. way back, we're talking, that's 2000 years ago, but let's jump a wee bit for, uh, nearer to us. Uh, here in the West, certainly we had the enlightenment, which was uh, in, the, in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, I mean, of course, in China, you also had uh, in the 10th and 12th century as a neo-Confucianism. So mm -hmm. none of these threads were, were constant. You know, they were constantly being developed in the newer cultures, both in China uh, and, in, uh, and here in the, uh, in the West. But the Enlightenment was a big deal because we have people like uh, Locke in England, Rousseau in France, uh, uh, Adam Smith, uh, who gave us, uh, you know, the foundation of economics and capitalism, which the whole world has embraced. Uh, mm -hmm. Wilson Craft, who was the first woman to really concentrate on the education of women, which, uh, which you know, really didn't come into being until the 20th century globally. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there was an interesting move beyond that, and that was the Marxists. Uh, so this is where East and West collided because Marxism was a global phenomenon. And as you know, had as much, has had as much influence in China as it did in the Soviet Union and in Europe. Right. And although Marx himself did not write much about education, he had a huge influence, huge influence. So you have people like Grans Gramsci, uh, Althusser, uh, Habermas, Freire, you know, the, these are all Marxist theories who believed that education had been used historically as an instrument of the state. You know, in other words, education was used to reinforce the views of the politicians in power. And in a capitalist analysis, that would have been, you know, those with the money, the oligarchy, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that had a huge influence in education and still hangs a shadow of, over everything. There is still in the teaching profession and in our universities quite a strong anti-corporate view, I would say. And that, uh, I think, has its roots in that type of theory. Mm -hmm. Marxism, of course, also had a direct influence on social constructivism, which became a dominant theory in education in the West uh, through Piaget, Vygotsky uh, from Russia, and Brunner, who translated Vygotsky into English, Margaret Donaldson and so on. And social constructivism, you know, the view that everything is a social construct, which I think is a, a misleading theory, personally. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong and much more on the cognitive science I side. I found that is in, in one of your myths, you know. Yes, I think it's become can, a dominant philosophical, a philosophical right. myth that everything is a social construct. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just, I don't, think, I don't think that two plus two equals four is a social mm -hmm. construct. <laughs> I think it's the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think it's also led to a distortion of the learning field in many ways. The idea that everything has to be social. I'm, not, I'm just not convinced that this is true. Much of what I've learned in my life has been in the quiet of my own room, thinking deeply about problems. You know, I find the busyness of group learning sometimes antithetical or the opposite of what I personally have needed in my life. But if we move on then, there was a, a big, a, the next big global influence on learning theory was the psychoanalysts. So we have Sigmund Freud and, you know, that notion that we could, you could peer into someone's unconscious and that determines their future. There is some truth in this, but we found out that most of what Freud had said was actually wrong. You know, most of his theories about dreams and sexuality and so on. But it had a big influence on coaching, mentoring, counseling, you know, in the, in the learning world, which again, I think we're drawing back on. 
However, it, it has had a big recent resurgence because mm -hmm. we have things like on the back of the Black Lives Movement and so on here in US and so on, we've had unconscious bias training, which I find mm -hmm. really bizarre, the idea that HR could probe your unconscious. I don't know what gives HR people the, the view that they have the, either the, you know, the scientific ability to do this or not, because the IAT test they use, even the people who wrote the IAT test say, don't use this, don't use it. There's no validity. So there's a lot of you know, mythical stuff has come out of the psychoanalytic tradition, which we're living with today. This notion that, you know, in L&D and HR, if we look at our employees, they're seen as having deficits, or it's almost as if they're ill or sick, and they have to be cured by L&D. I think this is wrongheaded, and a big, big mistake. You don't bring people with you. Moving on in history, then, on our, two th our quick run through the 2,500 years, if we move into schooling, mm -hmm. then we have, we've had a lot, Humboldt was a big influence. All the, you know, the very fact that you have PhDs and degrees, that all came out of the Prussian system in Germany and Berlin. And that massively influenced us globally. We are, we've all bought into the, you know, the BA, the BSc, followed by a master's, followed by, and that whole structure was giving, given to us by Humboldt in Germany. The university structure, as it were, although the universities were much older. But we have had lots of experiments in schooling. Montessori, Steiner, here in England, uh, Neil and Summerhill schools. None of them have stuck. By and large, globally, schools are much the same. You know, when I was in China, I think it was 15 years ago, you know, I went into several Chinese schools. They seemed very similar to the schools my children attended. You know, there was not, not much difference. There was uh, a one nice feature of Chinese schooling I liked was that the kids were allowed to sleep in the afternoon a little bit when they felt tired. That, that was nice. But other than that, the teaching was very similar. Mm -hmm. But then if we move forward in time to the behaviorists and the, the real science, this is where it gets really interesting. So uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we had, you know, people like Taylor in business. We have Pavlov, of course, from Russia. Uh, Thorndike around, uh, you know, the whole notion of transfer of learning with Skinner, Bandura, all of these people thought, but the problem there was it was an impoverished theory. It looked just at behavior. It didn't attempt to take into consideration motivation, emotion, many of those subjective features of consciousness uh, or, fear, uh, or the mind. So behaviorism was useful. I think one of the downsides of behaviorism these days is if you take gamification in learning, a lot mm -hmm. of it is really very basically Pavlovian, you know, treating us like rats in a cage. You know, we got right. to chase rubies around the maze or we have right. leaderboards or scores. And, and other Rewards and Pavlov. punishment mechanism. Yes, that's right. Rewards and punishment. We've taken that a bit too seriously in some of the very poor gamification I've right. seen. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, behaviorism then was, you know, took a shift when we had people like George Miller, who looked at uh, the nature of me memory, Atkinson and right. Schifrin. We suddenly right. saw that memory was a, we unpacked memory. We found that right. it was quite complicated. Working memory, long-term memory, the limits right. of working memory. So people like Badley in particular looked at working memory. And then we have Tulving, and Tulving was just wonderful. You know, he, he gave us the episodic versus semantic memory distinction, incredibly important in learning theory. The idea that we have two separate learning system, uh, memory systems here, one for semantic information like words and mathematics and so on. The other, which is more episodic, a bit like, you know, what did you have in the restaurant last night? And you recall it, oh, not like a video exactly, but as, as images as it were. And then we have a, an important theorist, I think, uh, Sweller, who looked at the limitations of short-term memory or working memory. The fact that we only have about 20 seconds of attention and we can only handle two or three things in our mind as we speak. So as you're listening to me give this 2,500 years talk, uh, your, your mind has 20 seconds. You've already forgotten most of what I've told you. That, that was Ebbinghaus, of course, the great German theorist. Uh, and it's a bit like a shooting star coming in through the atmosphere. As you watch, you're burning memory up behind you because you have not had a chance to reinforce it unless you're right. taking notes, unless you go back and look at it. So yeah. Ebbinghaus was an important feature. And that, then we have the you know, cognitive psychology, theorists right. around practice. We had, of course, William James, the, who, the father of psychology in the West. Uh, we have James Dewey, Ebbinghaus, I mentioned, Erickson, Bjorg, 
all of these people are practically useful if you're involved in the learning game. Right. You know, Bjorg is a good example. Bjorg tells us that most learners are actually quite delusional about how they learn. They actually don't know much about learning theory and therefore they make the wrong choices. You know, they take lots of notes and just underline them when they're a student. This is the wrong thing. Actually, you should be looking away from the screen and trying to recall things into your mind to reinforce them. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than just reading things from the page, right. it's, the, it's the act of recall that mm -hmm. really reinforces learning. Uh, and so those people were important. And then in our field, in L&D, we have the instructionalists. So we have people like Mager who, who forced us to think very clearly about what the objectives were, you know, in terms of performance, time. And that, that gave us focus, I think. But we also had Benjamin Bloom. And although most people will come to this later, most people see Bloom as that famous triangle. He never, he never, never had a triangle in any of his works. And the triangle is actually wrong. You know, it gives the wrong sense. It gives knowledge too much importance. It, it, it states it as a hierarchy, which is a big mistake. And then we have Gagné, Merrill, other instructionalists. And then of course, something went badly wrong. We had the learning styles theorists. Uh, oh. So this went way off beam and we had people like, uh, well, Bandler was the original, you know, introducing this stuff, but we had Fleming from New Zealand who just made this stuff up from his chair, you know, so we have the visual, auditory and kinesthetic, the VAK system, which I call the vacuous system, which is completely wrong. Uh, and yet it was a plague upon our schools globally. And then we had other, there are about 70 different learning styles theorists uncovered in the research, most, and they're all wrong learning styles simply do not exist. It was a bit of a myth. What people did is misinterpret personality types. If you've ever had to teach a class of 30 people or 100 people, you'll find there's some extroverts who always ask the questions, and then there are introverts who never ask the questions. That's personality styles. That's well-studied, research, mm -hmm. validated. Learning styles don't exist. Mm -hmm. And then we have some, I think, more interesting theorists around the big picture theory. People like Geary, who have looked at uh, the evolutionary influence on learning. And I was, we find it really easy. We didn't have to learn a language. You know, you learn Chinese, you were a grammatical genius, age three. Nobody taught you Chinese, really. You know, it, it came to you, as it were. And that's because our brains have evolved to pick up language almost immediately when we're young children. Face recognition. There are many things that evolution has given us that makes that type of learning easy. But if you try and learn mathematics, because we did not evolve to learn mathematics, it's very hard. Secondary type learning. So we have to pay attention to people like Geary. And then Jay Cross, a very good friend of mine, who's sadly no longer with us, but he gave us that distinction between formal and informal learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we spend all our money on formal learning, mm -hmm. schools, universities. And yet most of what we learn in life, when you get older, you realize that almost everything you learned was informal, you know, in the workplace from, from your colleagues and from your own efforts and so on. And then we have Seligman, the king, Seligman, the king of happiness, the Pied Piper of happiness, you know. I don't buy that theory either that everything is about happiness. Uh, I think that's a, an, funnily enough, a, a, a very poor and impoverished view of human nature. We don't live life to be happy. We live life to have a complex emotions, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to the movies and just watch comedies. You know, this would be, a, you know, nobody's like that, you know? Right. Uh, so I think sometimes that can be misleading. And then we have moralists, people like Maslow in the West, Abraham Maslow, which I think is another complete waste of time teaching Maslow. Again, yeah. his triangle, his pyramid. Right. Maslow never five. came up with a pyramid. Yeah, the five tiers. So we have, a, you know, you've noticed throughout this talk that the, uh, there are several theories that are completely and utterly wrong. The original authors had no idea what would happen to their theory. <laughs> Distorted, uh, you know, and changed so much that it's beyond recognition. And then we have uh, people like McLuhan and Postman who, give, who were very early theorists on the nature of social media and the way technology influences learning. And they're well worth reading. And then things went badly wrong again, I think, with the people around assessment and intelligence. You know, we had Isink who give us IQ, mm -hmm. big mistake, you know, that focusing on that very narrow area of cognition. And then we have Gardner who give us multiple intelligence and that was good because it widened it, the notion of intelligence out, but it was still a mistake because Gardner's multiple intelligences 
curiously match the school curriculum. You know, there, there's the clue that it's not right, you know. Uh, and therefore, I, it, it, it wasn't well validated in terms of the science. So I think that was a bit misleading. And even now we have people, uh, you know, we have people who are forcing emotional intelligence. That word intelligence crops up all the time, but it's the wrong word. And I can show you research. I mean, you know, Goldman's book on emotional intelligence was a huge global bestseller, but there's not much okay. science behind it. In fact, the more recent studies show that it's misleading. It's actually mm -hmm. confuses personality style with emotional intelligence. And then we have people like Myers-Briggs. I, you know, I can't tell you how much I dislike Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. the, the notion that you can do a little test on someone and that determines whether you hire them, whether they get promotion in their job is morally bankrupt because neither Myers nor Briggs had any science scientific background in them. The test is all wrong. It's, it's ancient theory now. And yet it's still floating around like a fossil, you know, like an artifact in our, our world. And, and then with Kirkpatrick, the four levels of Kirkpatrick, another hopelessly inadequate model for the measuring the evaluation mm -hmm. of learning. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through here at a really fast pace here, but we're coming really into the present now. No, because we have, I know. We have people like, you know, Hirsch and Robinson and so on in schools who think it's all about creativity. I think that's a mistake. <laughs> uh, some of learning is about creativity, but at the end of the day, if you want to be a good data science, scientist or whatever, you have to learn how to use data and understand what data is. Knowledge still really matters, you know? It has never gone away. The idea that you can be a journalist and just have critical thinking skills without a basis in reality and knowledge, I think is one of the great modern myths in learning, you know, 21st century skills and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a whole lot of teaching people, and then the social theorists are interesting, I think. People like Belbin, who give us how, you know, how do teams work in an organization? How do they learn? Mm -hmm. He gives us a structure for the nature of teams. And then Salas, a really brilliant researcher in the US, actually looked at how teams learn, because most of the social learning in an organization is in the context of a Did group. Did you say Salas? Salas, yes. Alex Salas? Salas, S-A-L-A-S. Yeah. So he's like a, it. yeah, he's yeah. a theorist. He looked at learning theory in the context of teams. And then Wenger, uh, is that, sorry. Is that uh, uh, Alex Salas? Yes, he's a, a, no, his first name, I've forgotten his first name. He's, uh, he's uh, Mexican or South American. He is Spanish. Right, uh, right. First name. I've forgotten his Alexandra. first name. Alexandra. Alexandra. I, I, let me think. I, it will come because to me in I a minute. Just, I, Oh, no, he's yeah, proven it's Eduardo. His name is Eduardo Salas. Okay, got it. Yeah, Another okay. Salas. Yeah, because I yeah. just had Alex uh, Salas on the show. <laughs> ah, right, okay. Well, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. Right. No, this is Eduardo is the name of this guy. So they're, just as there are two Donald Clarks, there are two Salases then. <laughs> right. They're both and from then, uh, Ecuador. I mean, yeah. He, yeah, th this guy's from Peru originally, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Eduardo. And then moving on, we have people like, uh, you know, just to end off, there's a really interesting English theorist called Julian Stodd, S-T-O-D-D, -D, who's looked at social learning. You know, he thinks we live in a social age and thinks that we should be paying attention to the social context in all learning. And he's an interesting theorist. But then just to finish off, we have the, we've moved in, into the online learning world. And of course, we have people like Papert, Prensky, you know, Downs and Siemens who came up with the first MOOC. We have people like uh, Richard Mayer who have studied online learning with 500 studies. He's the most cited author in the field. Nass right. and Reeves, Donald Norman and Nielsen on interface design. So we have a whole lot of theories around online learning. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, you cannot really do online learning without looking at those people because they have given us the bedrock upon which we build this stuff. And then there's online delivery people. That's a separate group in terms yeah. of learning theory. And that's people like uh, Jimmy Wales and Wikipedia, you know, who, and Jimmy Wales is not an educational theorist, but Wikipedia has become a global phenomenon. You know, the biggest database of knowledge in the history of our species. Everybody yeah. uses Wikipedia, certainly in the, our part of the world. Yeah. And then we have yeah. uh, Martin Dugimas who gave us Moodle from Australia. Martin's mm -hmm. interesting. He was brought up in the Australian desert and didn't go to school. So he was perfectly suited to building Moodle because he's become a real player in terms of, you know, the distribution of an open source learning management system. And then mm -hmm. people like Salman Khan with the Khan Academy and teaching maths, free content. 
uh, Sugata Mitra, the hole in the wall idea. I don't know if you've seen that. I, I think that's actually misleading and a bit mythical, the, the research around that. And then the MOOC people like Andrew Nigg uh, and, and uh, Kehler at Stanford. And these are artificial intelligence people who have given us, uh, they gave us Coursera, you know, the massive global. It's now worth $1 billion, Coursera. Udacity, right. Sebastian Thrun, it's worth $1 billion. So this has changed the learning landscape. Uh, and then my last group, I call them the outsiders, people who don't fit any of those categories. These are uh -huh. really interesting are, people. Are they're, they? they're, they're, they're the weird people who come from left of field. And uh, one of those is a guy called Illich, Ivan Illich. And he was a priest uh, in South America originally. And uh, his book called De-Schooling Society, I absolutely love. Uh, he thought that schooling had gone all wrong. It was really almost a continuation of just as you had the a Confucian influence in education. We had a Christian influence in education. He thought this was all wrong, that it was constricting people and didn't give us a, an open and flourishing view of education. And then we have people like Roger Shank in America who thinks that school is all wrong. You know, we should be giving people practical skills, tapping into their interest rather than a fixed curriculum. And people like Peter Thiel uh, in America who thinks that universities are a bit of a mistake. You know, we're stuck with them, but they're expensive. And what they are is a bit like the Catholic Church in Europe, you know, before the Reformation. You pay for this degree, you pay a lot of money for a piece of paper, and that mm -hmm. saves you from sin. It saves you from going to hell, you know, the hell of unemployment. He thinks that the whole thing is a con, you know, it's a Ponzi scheme in a way, and that we would be better to spend that money on a more balanced view of education, more vocational skills. And this is very, very true, I think, in America, where I mean, we, we see that in modern politics. China has had this amazing rise economically because, and that didn't really, Chinese, the Chinese economy grew not on the back of having a higher education system. It, it grew on the back of having a very strong government and an entrepreneurial spirit that, mm -hmm. that absolutely blossomed, you know? And they, so in America, they abandoned vocational and practical skills and China at the same time, gathered those skills and actually did all that work. So we have that curious balance in the globally now, uh, which Peter Thiel mentions, you know, he thinks that the West got too academic for its own good, as it were, you know, whereas China has a sense of realism. I think mm -hmm. there's some truth in that. And then mm -hmm. Kaplan is a really good theorist on this. His book, The Cost of Education, takes a deep dive into all this. So just to summarize, we have these big religious Confucian influences from the past. We have the influence of science and scientific theory. We have the online theorists and technology theory. All of this is like the strands in a rope, you know? They're all bound together to give us what we have today, which is why studying the past is incredibly useful for understanding the present. So that was a, that was a real spin through two and a half thousand years of learning theory, but all 100 learning theorists are on my blog. You know, you can just go there and you can look, up, look them all up. And uh, I spent a lot of time writing those because I myself felt I had to get to grips with it to understand where we were. And so right. took, over many years, took, I, I was always, Karl Marx always, when he read a book, he would always do a one page summary. And I've done that all my life. So I had plenty of notes. I just formalized all my notes really. But so there we are, that's the end. You'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I have to, I have to give you a, a standing ovation on that. I mean, I believe all my audience will do too, because, wow, I'm just like, I can take a deep, deep breath now because <laughs> you have been pounding us with all these. I mean, I'm like traveling in, and I, I, I was in the time machine and traveling with you, you know, through time, 2,500 yeah. years ago. And, uh, you know, the Socrates and Plato's and all those here and Confucius. Well, you started with Confucius and it's from China. So, and then from yeah. that on, then that on time on, and I just go and I know mo uh, most of them I heard, but some of those, especially the modern ones, and uh, they're especially your last group, not many of them. <laughs> I'm familiar with because they're so modern and they're still going on. And uh, your last category, your last group of uh, the elites. And, uh, but they are notable people, notable figures in, 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 the, in the history, I, I'm sure. I want to ask you, because you have all these 
uh, Ms., you have the plan B and you create uh, wildfire. I mean, you provide services and you have, have the time to conduct all these kind of researches. And you have huge blogs, like endless blogs and, uh, and it's, 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 it's endless. And uh, so, so many, so tell us, uh, I wanna ask you a, a focus on the next a few myths, you know, the myth that you talk about leadership, uh, EI, you talk a little bit about emotional intelligence and learning styles, so you cover a little bit. Uh, Myers-Briggs, uh, MBTI a little bit, uh, but learning objectives, uh, diversity, NLP, mindfulness, uh, and social uh, Piaget and uh, social constructivism, you also cover that. So we, can we start with leadership? Why is also a myth? Well. You know, when I first started in the learning game, that's 35 years ago, the word leadership barely existed. You know, there were no books mm. in the it was called management. Right. And then what happened is, this I think came from the US, there were a number of speakers at conferences and in a very US fashion, you know, the US fashion and uh, management theory then was, just think it and it will happen, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you would get lots of motivational speakers like Robbins and so on. And I saw those people speak, but I was always suspicious. You know, because who would deny that we are living through times where perhaps we have the worst leadership we are, I have seen in my entire lifetime? Political mm -hmm. leadership, sports leadership, business leadership. You know, ordinary people despair when they look at their leaders these days. They don't mm -hmm. respect them because I think we've got carried away with this word leadership. You know, if I walked into a bar and I asked, uh, I asked you, George, I said, well, what do you do for a living? And you go, well, I'm a leader. I would go, get away. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? What an arrogant thing to say. The very language of leadership is something that, that is absurd to me. You know, this binary leaders and followers world, this hierarchy. Right. Right. And that's the very opposite of what L&D and learning is meant to be about. And so we have these courses, we take people through leadership, it's got nothing to do with leadership. Actually, most leadership courses are just, you know, standard 101 management theory courses. And I think we should be a wee bit more honest about that. And there is a great book called Leadership Bullshit, Leadership BS by a professor from Stanford called Pfeffer, P-F-E-F-F-E-R. I have the book up uh, behind me. I'll just show you it now for your viewers. Sure, sure, Pfeiffer. Because it's right behind me. I, uh, this is a book I really respect. Uh, so I want to see the cover of it. Yeah, Leadership, yes. And by Pfeffer, so it's Jeffrey Pfeffer, P-F-E-F-F-E-R. Now, this is a serious book. He's a serious academic. And his view, his point, he, he makes the same point that I'm making, that leadership is a construct of L&D, learning and development. You know, we invented leadership. And then we forced it on people through courses. And then people bought into this bullshit, as, uh, as Jeffrey would call it. And it, it's misleading because it gives people a false view of their role in an organization, you know, that they are the leaders and everybody else has to follow them. Or, you know, how many books have you seen with a word, an adjective in the front, you know, social leadership, uh, you know, charismatic leaders. There's hundreds of books. There's no right. solid theory in the area. It's right. really people just writing books for the sake of writing them a lot of the time. Right. And then, of course, it, like that. Yeah, and it gives L&D a false sense of their own, own importance. Oh, yeah. We, we call, we, we you call know, them the, 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 the fat books, you know, the fats, you know, or yeah. the uh, phenomenal yeah. books. They're uh, just a phenomenon. They, they, they just, block, like a flower, they just blossom overnight, and then next morning they're, they're withered away. So something That's like that. correct, yeah. And that, in a sense, uh, that's a nice word to pick up on there, George, the, the, the notion of a fad because L&D is unique in business in, in being very fond and, you know, they love fads. So, you know, the latest one was mindfulness. That's now coming off the boil. Nobody cares about mindfulness now. It had, a, you know, it's five years of glory in the sun. Uh, and the, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is we, you can put them in different buckets, really. There is one big area which you might call the therapeutic type fads. Uh, you know, mm. all about your unconscious, like unconscious bias training, mindfulness, neuro-linguistic programming, all of that stuff you can put in therapeutic myths, you know, that right. quite neatly. And I think that's just a result of what I described in my history of learning theory. It came out of the psychoanalytic movement from Freud, Carl Rogers, and those people. Mm. <coughs> and of course, <coughs> excuse me, 
L and D people are people people. And they're, you know, they're my people. I like, they're really nice people by and large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they take the people people thing a wee bit too seriously and think they have the ability to diagnose us, you know, our minds. And nobody has, nobody, you know, we don't know how the mind works. And the idea that someone in L and D has the ability to probe my unconscious is patently absurd. I mean, what on earth do they think they're playing? First of all, have they any right to do this? I don't think so. Why? Secondly, they are they qualified? Not, not a chance. Right. So the therapeutic area is one, yeah. That, there are lots mm -hmm. of fads there. And then the other ones you mentioned, of course, were what you might call the measurement fads. Mm -hmm. L&D loves to measure people. Let's oh, yeah. do a quiz, you know, let's see Myers-Briggs. Let's see what the personality type is like. How about uh, the disc? Uh, I mean, there are discs, uh, there are discs, there are MBTI, there are, you know, all, all kinds of assessment tools and inventories and uh, uh, services in China. So are you familiar with disc? Yeah, yes, I, see. I am. See, oh, disc isn't so bad because the one good thing one can salvage from this, if we go back to the science, is that personality type is quite well researched. So the, the ocean, O-C-E-A-N, which is linked to this, yeah, that's yeah, actually yeah. reasonably well validated. You know, we, we can look at, uh, you know, uh, neuroticism, extroverts, introverts, and so on. Those axes are quite well researched and have strong validity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I have no problem with that type of measurement. But when it comes to learning styles, emotional intelligence, Myers-Briggs, that's all fluffy. You know, it, it, it's not okay. grounded in the science. And some of it is positively misleading, especially Myers-Briggs. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone should be using Myers-Briggs if they believe in science, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's, become, it's yeah. become what you might call a Ponzi scheme. You know, you get trained in Myers Briggs, and then you can you you buy you the course, you get trained, then you sell it to somebody else. You know, it's it's that sort of scheme. And whenever you whenever you see a theory being turned into a marketing idea, you've got mm -hmm. to think carefully about what really drives it forward. And then, of course, there were another set of fads around. You know, the word intelligence, emotional intelligence, multiple intelligence, IQ. We've discussed that already in in some detail. But there's one group that particularly annoys me, and that's what you might call the triangle or pyramid myths. And mm. we, have a bit, we have a fondness in L&D for just taking a diagram that we, because it looks good on PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So we love Abraham Maslow, because the Maslow pyramid, that nice colored pyramid, looks great. Complete right. nonsense. Maslow never had a pyramid. I never thought it was hierarchical. Abraham Maslow <laughs> never had that pyramid? No, and it, it, he never went anywhere near. In fact, he did not believe it was strictly hierarchical like this. And okay. so, but of course, what people do is nobody reads Maslow. You know, nobody reads the actual texts. Everybody just looks at the PowerPoint and thinks they know it. But Maslow, you know, Maslow was a much more sophisticated thinker than those people in America. And the whole self-actualization thing was based on a few people he knew, his friends. There was no scientific basis to Maslow at all, no research. So when you do go back and you go, wow, this is, this is, some of this is nonsense, you know, like 1960s type uh, new age faddish theory, theorizing. And then it was completely warped into a triangle for the sake of PowerPoint. And it's become mm -hmm. a meme, you know, it got fossilized into those PowerPoints. But it's also true of Bloom's triangle, which Bloom never, ex never came up with a triangle. Right. You know? He's that, he got that big circle thing, you know. That's right. Well, Bloom, I mean, what people, the, the, when you see the triangle, that's the knowledge component. He came up with a big tripartite distinction originally, you know, between the emotional or affective and then psychomotor and knowledge components of learning. But people ignore the psychomotor and emotional side. They dump that, just go for the knowledge pyramid. And then they use the pyramid, but never realize that Bloom never actually, <laughs> that's not actually what Bloom said in the first place. You know, there's a much subtler theory than that. Right. And so you get that sense that knowledge is, you know, not that important in Bloom. We you got know, a, we, we, we got one uh, book on, uh, on, uh, um, on uh, Bloom's taxonomy, and then that's the cover is that triangle. <laughs> yeah. There are two books of, uh, on, uh, in Chinese, there are two uh, translated versions, and one of them use that uh, triangle as a cover. That's I have right. That book. I have All that right. Book over there. <laughs> I want to well, show you. You want to see it? <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, let's have a look at it because that, that would be interesting. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, just a second, let me uh, find it. I don't know where it is. So here we go. Here you go. Oh yeah. Oh, 
Oh, it's, it's, it's green screened out there. Yeah, oh, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that triangle was actually uh, built by other people afterwards who applied Bloom's theory. It had nothing to do with Bloom at all. And in oh, fact, wow. the really good theorist, his pupil wrote a very good book saying, don't use the triangle. Whatever you do, don't use the triangle. Right. And then Daniel Willingham is a much, I, I have in my blog a, an alternative diagram because what Bloom actually said that knowledge was an underlying thing, always present in a sense in our learning. And therefore it, it's not a hierarchy at all, but you can look at my blog and, uh, and have a look at and see what the, you know, the real representation should be if you, if you want. Right, I've written right. a bit about that. Yeah. A lot the third big triangle, of course, was Dale's one where you may have seen this. It's very common in the US, which is mm -hmm. we learn 10% by uh, reading uh, and lecturing. And then it goes up to we learn 90% by teaching. And it's always in a triangle. And it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. First of all, if you have any mathematics in you, you would be immediately suspicious that everything was around the percentage. Uh, and secondly, it was made up. That is a complete fiction, that one. And I, uh, Will Falheimer, various people and myself have looked into the history of that triangle. And that's completely bogus. That was complete, a complete fiction made up. And it appears in so many talks at conferences. I've seen the uh, vice chancellors of universities present that triangle before. Who, who, uh, uh, what's the name? Who, who, who made that uh, research? Okay, well, the, the, interesting thing, the interesting thing that it wasn't the original cone was a guy called Dale D A L E, but he right. didn't he didn't actually mean for it to be turned into a pyramid and for these statistics to be attached to it. Right, then right. there was a then somebody completely lied and referenced an academic paper by a Chinese <laughs> author, interestingly, and then <coughs> when that author was contacted, they go, "Hold on, it's nothing to do with that. It's a completely separate paper." Mm -hmm. So the, the, it was a fiction, it was invented, and actually mm -hmm. it was a lie. It then became embedded in train the trainer courses, and is very commonly seen these days in PowerPoint again because it looks great on PowerPoint. So whenever you see a, a whenever you see a pyramid, always be suspicious. <laughs> it's very rarely accurate. It very rarely represents the original. Except, picture. except it, I'm in Carol. <clears throat> except, sorry. Except I'm in, when I'm in Carroll and looking at the Except real pyramid. Except when you're pyramid. in <laughs> Oh, that's so right. That's I right. a pyramid, not including, yeah. uh, excluding the uh, the real pyramids. <laughs> yeah, unless you unless you can climb it or climb inside it, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. Yeah. So those myths, you know, I, I have I've blogged a lot about this because I think, in a sense, right. if we're going to progress as L and D. We need to take a broom to the cupboard and clean our act up a bit, you know, and get rid of the bat. Many of these theories are 50 and 60 years old. Bloom, 60 years old. Kirkpatrick's right. another one. 50, 60 years old. Uh, 61, 61 years old. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it goes back to the behaviorist context, you know, and yeah. those behaviors yeah. moved on, but we got stuck yeah. with behaviorist theory. Yeah. And then we, yeah. we because we fossilized it. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, if you if you look, uh, read uh, uh, Will Tallheimer's, uh, well, by the way, I interviewed uh, Jim Kirkpatrick on the show too yeah. at the very first round because in China, the L and D professionals, we just love evaluation. <laughs> you know, we love evaluation. We just blindly love evaluation. Why? Because we want recognition. Because China. You know, it's a more hierarchical society, and we want our, you know, uh, top management to recognize the value of learning, of the training department. So how do we do it? So we try to evaluate. So when we evaluate, I said, when you're out of breath, try to put in a lot of efforts, try to evaluate the value of your program, it means it doesn't have any value because it <laughs> has value. <laughs> well, you see, well, well you're. Other people will tell you, right? Other the business leaders will, will will say that in the boardroom. You don't have to be present, so they will tell you. I mean, somebody else will rumor back. You know, the rumor mill back say, "Oh, somebody tell you I said on that that meeting." And business leaders will come with you with a different attitude. Yeah. Instead of throw away over the wall here, this is a retraining request, or just uh, you know, we don't have time to to for training. You know, yeah. that attitude. 
Well, in a sense, Kirkpatrick doesn't do as much good there because most people don't get to level four. They get stuffed with happy sheets in level one and two. And mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, when I said earlier, you've got to be aware of a marketing theory. So the fact that you interviewed Jim, who Jim is Donald, Donald Kirkpatrick, who I, I met his father, the guy who originally did the theory. Right. Right, right. And Donald, he's a really nice guy, same name as me. But the very fact that it's now a family tradition shows that there's something wrong with this. You know, it's a business. It's not a theory. And therefore, I, 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 think, I think the sooner we get rid of Kirkpatrick as a theory, the better, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, because we now have the ability to gather real data. Right, you know, this is right. why I'm interested in artificial intelligence. If you gather really good data using mm -hmm. the technology itself, then you have right. a really accurate scientific approach to evaluation. And you don't have right. to get out those silly little sheets where people do ticks and boxes and tell you that they like the biscuits or something at the training course, you know? Right. This, right. this was right. very, this was never evaluation. It was statistically completely wrong. It measured the wrong things and never got to the real question, which you asked, George, which is, you know, right. what, what, imp what impact does this have for those people running this organization? How does it what? really change things? Right, right. Uh, just, uh, uh, just a little bit of a side note to my audiences in China uh, and other developing countries. Uh, this is not, uh, this is a pro a, a pro professional. What, what Donald and I are talking about, are discussing are totally, but uh, both Jim and Donald are very, very important figures in the learning development. They've made huge contributions and they foster many learning development professionals. Their contribution is, uh, is absolutely uh, enormous. But uh, scientifically, we're talking about, so that's right now, we're talking about sci science. So, and uh, back to you, uh, Donald, we, uh, my partner and I, we tried to, just a little bit side note, we tried to uh, prove the value of training a long time ago. I'm, I'm in this business nearly 30 years now. And uh, I, my last job was overseeing IBM's China's, you know, China's uh, learning development function 10 years ago, I quit. And then I started my own company with my partner. So we co-founded uh, co Improvement Consulting. We threw in 10 years. We went away, we, we left, uh, not left, but not de never departed, but we kind of uh, standing on the field on the bottom of, on the basis of learning development, we went up to management. Hold on a second, let me show you that. Okay. We went up to management. And uh, so after 10 years of research, we, we, uh, we wrote this book, it's called The Logic of Management. Got you. The Logic of Management, it's, it's, in, re it's, in, in, it's in, in, in white text here, Got so you. you can't read them, but the Chinese is here, Logic of Management. So what we found out, this is our model on the back, but I can send you a chapter later. I mean, after this call, I can send you a chapter. It's published a uh, book. We contributed a chapter, it's about 26 pages just last year. And uh, so what we found out is that uh, the value of training doesn't have anything to do with training. It's business. Yeah. Yeah. It's business, Not, nothing to do with all this, oh, I instructional design, this learning technology, that uh, you know, delivery method or the TTT. Nothing to do with that, but the value proposition, the value system of the entire company, not only you, how about the finance department, the sales? I mean, coming from the very beginning, okay, the customer service, right? And sales, marketing, uh, manufacturing, design, R&D, uh, logistics, uh, finance, and, you know, HR, legal, uh, quality here, and then uh, even, you know, uh, strategic planning, all that, you know, 25, 30 departments in the company. Every, yeah. every we call it the fundamental basic rule is everything is business. Yeah. Everything, everything, every department is an outsourced to come, outsourced uh, uh, service, like the training department is an outsourced, you're, 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 lear you're learning vendor, your, your training vendor, you're also into your, through the bidding process, you, you win the, you win the bid, you come and provide your learning service to, uh, to my company for a year. Yeah. This is kind of all sorts way of thinking, because if you don't, if you don't, you, you're still like thinking, oh, I'm backstage, you know, I'm kind of internal function. I'm a cost center. You're kind of in that cozy zone. You never can stand up and fight for your real value. You're so comfortable. But in this outsourced way of thinking, you're, also, you're a vendor. That means at the end of the year in the boardroom, at the end of the last day, you have to prove to your CEO by numbers, 
by yeah. money, money, money numbers, how much value we have created for this company. Yeah. Don't tell me how many courses you, I don't care how many yeah. people you have trained. I don't care how yeah. much money you have made for me. Build that link with the, with the real income. Otherwise you don't have value. Otherwise, if you can not build that link, you're still like doing the training like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, nothing changed. But this is modern technology. That's why I'm so interested in, in your way of AI learning. We'll come back to that. But it's just kind of a side note to just kind of a... I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the good, the good news is that the technology now allows, you, allows us to do exactly what you've recommended, George, you know. We, right. we have learning in the workflow. We have things called learning experience platforms, which are allowing people to learn in the, more directly in the workflow uh, and in the workplace, which gives that concrete link between what you learn and what you do in the real world. Because transfer and practice, all those things have been ignored. And the, you know, learning is a process. It's not an event. What we've mm -hmm. delivered for decades are events, classroom courses. It's a process, and that process is in the work. It has impact on work. And if right. you use technology cleverly, you can harvest the data, and you can use that data to improve the process as well, which is what AI or artificial intelligence does. We have a unique opportunity to apply what you've written in the book, The Logic uh, of Business, in l and right. and gather the right data mm -hmm. uh, and not yep. illusory data. You know, we can, we can yep. get... We can Actually... Deliver. You're right on. What we found out, the management actually, in essence, as a science or as a law of management, there's no people in that. And nothing to do with people. It's all, of, it's all about mathematics. It's all about resonance. Resonance, you know, this world is a vibrating world. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan in, you know, theoretical, theoretical physics. And re resonance is a string theory or the string of the M theory or the super string theory. Uh, those are the fundamentals of how this world is created. The books doesn't, the table doesn't exist, the computer doesn't exist, actually. They just exist temporarily. If we dump them in 100 years, they will de dissolve back into atoms, you know, uh, electrons, and, you know, and then those quarks. And, and then basically they're all composed, including our humans, where our life, our life expectancy is only like 100, 100 years at most, most of us. And uh, we only exist 100 years, but when, when we die, we become something else. That's why there's a circle of life, like the Lion King says, you know, <laughs> the circle of life, everything. So everything, the, you know, we, we, we change forms to exist. But when we come to a, or an organization for profit organization during our period of time or non-for-profit organization, we need to create that, create that resonance uh, uh, also. And that's composed of what the right, correct way or the most efficient way of doing things, of getting things, you know, because efficiency is so important for management. And uh, it, at the very people and the right way of doing things are both important. It's like your left hand and right hand, which one is important to, to you? <laughs> both hands are important, but there is a sequence. There is a priority. Priority is doing, find out the way of doing things most efficiently and then you have the right people and then or you have the right people already and then you have to cover that gap that you have to find out the the correct way of or the most efficient way of doing things and only that can you be successful as a business yeah, yeah. i agree we, I yeah mean, it's I have, totally yeah. mathematics yeah the i mean I've, for the last two years i've been working uh, with a company called learning pool and building a, an lxp system and it's called stream and that pushes and pulls stuff to and from the work face, you know? And mm -hmm. it was, if you need to know something while you're doing your job, it has a little chat bot, it sits and boom, and you can go and find the learning material when you need it at the right time, right place. And, but there's also the push, you know, notifications, the sort of things we mm -hmm. see in social media. So I right. think we're now learning how to use technology cleverly to be mm -hmm. quite scientific and data-driven in our approach, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. what every other area of the business does now, you know? So we're in catch-up mode, but we're getting there. Right, so, right. Speed systems, learning record stores, these sort of things are coming of age. The technology is solving, it's putting your book into action, you know, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. That's what it's doing. How about, uh, there, there is also uh, a myth, uh, learning objectives. Why that yeah. is also a myth? Well, the, the, the original, you know, objectives came out of the behaviorist tradition. In other words, you will have this performance objective and then we'll just 
train you in a sort of Pavlovian fashion to meet that objective. You know, that, that was the roots, Meger, and these were behaviors type theorists, the very uh -huh. famous in objectives. But the big mistake was that LND took this far too seriously. So on the front of every course, you had a list mm -hmm. of learning objectives. Right. <laughs> I, have no, I have no problem with people having objectives and designing courses, you know? That's a useful mm -hmm. way of getting the logic of a course into a, into a designed entity. But when you slap, I mean, imagine going to a movie, like the movie uh, Titanic, okay? You sit uh -huh. down in the movie theater, and the first thing that comes up is, well, you're going to watch this movie. A ship sails from Southampton. It hits an iceberg. 1,000 people die, but we'll throw in a little romantic story to keep you happy. You go, are you kidding me? What are you doing? <laughs> you spoiled the whole movie. And of course, learning objectives are the most boring thing imaginable for a learner. And yet it's the first <laughs> thing we give them. So in what universe do we, in what world did we imagine that boring the learner from the beginning would be a good way to deliver training? Uh, and of course, okay. this is another fossilized theory. I would say get rid of learning objectives. Imagine going to a website and you're booking a flight from Shanghai to Beijing. Uh -huh. and, and there's a whole page of object. This, uh, this website will allow you to book a flight. Of course, right. I know that, you know. And the idea that, well, it's useful because it tells you what people are going to be doing, you know. Well, has anybody ever walked out a course after reaching the objectives? They go, oh, oh yeah, I don't need objective two. I'm going to walk. No, they never do that. So the, I'm really against the presentation of learning objectives and the obsession with objectives. The, because it's a behaviorist, a behaviorist obsession, and there's no need in a presentation layer to have them. You know, all motivation theory shows you that that's the last thing you should do is mm -hmm. bore people to death on the of first week of learning. But but on the other side, uh, you know, there's a, Dane has a nine events of instruction, and also there's adult learning theories and. And uh, if we don't inform them at the very beginning, and then they won't draw their attention. And also ARC's model, uh, John Keller's ARC's model also say that we need to arouse their attention so that they, they know that what they're gonna do is gonna contribute to their value proposition or to realizing a realization of their values and you know and help them it will be useful for them. Otherwise they will, they will say, ah, I'm not interested. So. So okay. yeah, that's right. But you see, Gagne, Gagne was wrong in this. First of all, the, the state objectives was the second of his eight steps. So, and people it is you know, it is first step. But yeah, Gagne again came out partially. He was sort of half cognitive, half behaviorist, really. But I think it was Gagne was the villain here. Yeah, that's what got the whole learning uh, objectives thing going. But to me, they're quite simply wrong. There is nothing in modern contemporary theory that says the first thing you should do, if the aim is to excite people and get them get their attention, then the last thing you want to do is have a list of text objectives on the screen. Nobody in their right, right mind would do that. Right. There are many other ways of doing it. So the great in, in change management theory and management, for example, you would create a sense of urgency. You know, you want to just grab people's attention. You know, look at the opening scene of a movie. Exactly, exactly. You set the movie trailers, the movie trailers, yeah. yeah. And we don't yeah. do enough of that. You know, that's the people we know a lot about this. You know, people have been doing it for a century in the movies and in TV. People do it in novels, and we dump all that and look up a little list from Gagne and go, Yeah, let's let's list some objectives on the screen. You go, It's crazy, really. Uh, but we're the good news is that technology has shown this up for what it is rather old fashioned. And that nobody puts objectives really up on websites. On YouTube, yeah, on YouTube, there's a paid channel called the, Cur the Curiosity, and that they have fantastic videos and uh, scientific knowledge. And yeah. I think the word they, they pick the word is is after is is a is a modern million dollar business. But uh, they I think they chose this word is it because curiosity. And I think what we're talking about is this word curiosity. So we yeah. build curiosity into the learners and the modern technology. Uh, so let them kind of do the uh, more um, uh, exploring, uh, exploring, uh, explore, uh, exploring um, um, learning, and uh, to to let them give them opportunity to try to try out and uh, keep them curious, you know, and uh, nice and uh, yeah, keep them going. Well, the scientific. Like quite good on this. You know, we've had uh, decades of motivation theory. We know the role that emotion plays in learning. The DeMello, there are many, you know, I could give you half a dozen theorists in that area. 
We know a lot about this now, the role of emotion, how to engage people, and that's often a misleading word, engagement. But actually, curiosity has a scientific basis. It's called the seeking, you know, it's an aspect of motivational theory. But we know why right. and how this works. We just don't apply it very well in L&D. Mm -hmm. We tend to think that these old behaviorist techniques work well, but that they're just artifacts from the past. Mm -hmm. And if we looked at contemporary theory, the answers are there. I've just finished a book called Learning Experience Design that will be published this year. And I, yeah. I have I have big chapters on this, you know, on transfer and practice, on the role of emotion in learning, on the role of a, 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 not only emotion, but the whole notion of motivational theory, which is incredibly important. But you have to transfer that theory into practice. How do we design right. courses and learning experiences to, to make that work? Right, right, absolutely. So this is great. This is great. I mean, all the myth, myth uh, that we talk about uh, pretty often, uh, oftentimes is here in China. They have been existing for, oh gosh, 10 years, 20 years now. And because China's, uh, just give you, a, Donald, just give you a little bit of background that China's uh, opening up and reform happened like 41 years ago, formally started and then but not only during the past 20 years the learning uh, learning and development field just you know when really took off and uh, now we're learning from America from UK from Australia uh, majorly from America you know and uh, because you know the ATDs and the ISPIs and all that so we're learning a lot so we're now still kind of absorbing Chinese um, practitioners or at least are estimate conservatively 10 million of them, you know, because that's 20, 10 to 20 million uh, L&D practitioners, but they need all these kind of nutritions, like just like uh, uh, leadership is very big in China. EI is very big. Learning styles, not anymore. Uh, MBTI, not many more, but being replaced by, by many others. Learning objectives, still the old, the old ILT. So mm -hmm. learning objectives, still very, uh, very big. Maslow's hierarchy, and uh, that was like 10 years ago, it was very diversity. Uh, NLP uh, flourished a little bit. Uh, mindfulness, uh, the last myth I wanna uh, head on is mindfulness and that will be the, the last one to, 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 to talk about. So tell us a little bit of my, what is mindfulness and why is a myth too? Well, mindfulness again, you know, going back to my 2,500 years of learning theory, Mindfulness comes out really of another religious source, which is Buddhism, which of course uh, has, a, has had a presence in the history of China uh, in a major fashion uh, in Japan and so on. So the, the mindfulness, you know, as a theory was plucked out, uh, you know, from this Buddhist tradition as being a way of both stilling and being attentive. So it's one mm -hmm. very narrow, narrow thing. Unfortunately, it has not stood the test of time. So the more recent research has shown that mindfulness has a very, it's, it's completely questionable whether it has any, let's suppose you put your employees, you're employing 1000 people, you give them 20 minutes of mindfulness twice a week. You have to, you're going back to your problem about cash and impact on business. That's mm -hmm. a huge amount of dropped productivity. You have to know with absolute certainty that the mindfulness course will increase their productivity, mm -hmm. and that that increase will be more than the money and cost you spent while they were doing nothing, being mindful. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the problem is that the more recent research has shown that mindfulness may actually be harmful to people. This is a really counterintuitive idea, but those people who already have are suffering from mild depression, it would appear that mindfulness can actually do quite a bit of harm. And the reason for that is that it makes people even more inward looking and introspective. Mm -hmm. And so things like uh, cognitive behavioral theory recommend that to avoid mental illness and, and, and psychological problems, you should not be become obsessed by your inner world because that leads to a spiral of depression. Mm -hmm. And that there's some quite interesting papers showing that mindfulness now can be, can exacerbate that problem and not help people at all. So I think, when L and D play with psychology like this, mm -hmm. or the therapeutic end of psychology, they're playing with fire, because they don't really understand it. You're not really qualified right. psychotherapists, right. 
and therefore I feel that this is yet another fad that has almost had its day. So again, all these things have a history. I, they, you know, they have a sort of curve, a peak, and then they die. <laughs> Some of them go on forever, like learning styles and Kirkpatrick and so on. But I think, uh, I think mindfulness is already on its downward dying phase, as it were. There and is an, uh, there is also an organization called the IOM. I remember it's called Institute for Organizational Mindfulness. Is that the same thing? Yeah, I mean that's the, it's the same thing. Whenever you get a fad, you get an institute. <laughs> you know, this is the truth. You know, there were, there's always somebody who wants to make make formalize it, turn it into a course, make money from the courses, and this right. is where I think we go wrong. We want to, you know, going back to that phrase, learning is a process, not an event. L and D right. people always want to create events, you know, and organizations and structure and yeah. formalize everything. What, and this is what, a big mistake. Right, right. What what I found out, Donald, is that a lot of activities in the learning throughout the world, not only in China, not only in the United States, in the United Kingdom, but elsewhere. Uh, I interviewed uh, guests from from Chile, from Germany, from South Africa, from UK, and next time having someone from Australia. And uh, but a lot of experts. It happens all over the world. Is that a lot of activities or services are based on it, it's all money driven. You know what I mean? It's not science driven. It's all no. money driven. So that kind of, uh, you know, probably they play with it around with. It. Well, financially speaking, that's totally understandable. There people are making a living, but to make our profession better, to provide better value or higher value to our clients who we serve. I think we should go back to science and abide by the scientific laws and uh, the correct way of doing things instead of uh, you know, reinventing, I mean, inventing something out of the chair or after beer in the bar and then say, oh, we come up with this model, the pyramid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it happens almost every year. You know, there's always some new fad that people latch onto and then we spend literally billions. I mean, yes. unconscious bias training is the big one at the moment. You know, huge sums right. of money have been spent. Right. Already, already the studies are showing that it does not work. And uh, how about how about uh, I'll, I'll 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 bring up two two more. One is action learning. The other is micro course, micro learning, because yeah. these two are very big in China still, and also coaching. I oh my god, coaching. Yeah. I had I interviewed a couple of people uh, on coaching as well on, on, in this series. So first of all, action learning. What do you think about it? Is, is it really learning? Yeah, well, action learning, I think, is interesting because there is a good scientific basis to this. So there is a very good book by Rodiger and McDaniel, who are two scientists, you know, learning scientists. Make It Stick is the name of the book. Uh, and they have looked at the last 10, 15 years of cognitive psychology. And one of the great findings of that book, this is why I mentioned earlier this notion of retrieval practice, you know, turn away, think, mm -hmm. recall into your mind. We've been using artificial right. intelligence to do open input questions on online learning, where I ask you a question, I might say, you know, a, what is the population yeah. uh, of Scotland? Uh, and uh, what is the capital of Scotland? Yeah. You go into your mind and go, what is it again? Is it, is it Glasgow? Is it Birmingham? I've, yeah. You, you yeah. go into your mind. Now, yeah. effortful learning, let's not call it right. active learning, making the effort cognitively. I like that. Effortful learning, that has, that's well researched and it really does work. But you really have to push people beyond simple multiple choice questions. You know, you have mm -hmm. to, this is why practice and transfer really matters. Right. You don't learn anything without practicing it and applying it and generating new knowledge. You don't learn anything, you know, knowledge and skills do not transfer into the workplace and oh, without a great deal of practice and application. So active learning is reasonable if it's effortful learning. And there, uh, the stuff I've been doing with artificial intelligence really forces people to think hard. This is what's right. all thinking hard about issues. And that's right. why I think the multiple choice question is a mistake because the answer is there on the screen in front of you. How about so, micro learning? Well, micro learning has a place, but I, I don't like the term micro learning because it, it right. just tends to, it tends to suggest that you just make it small and that's the answer. And they, uh, <laughs> Actually, the truth is that micro learning has a point because in the science, we have a theory of chunking that goes back to people right. like Miller. Information chunking, yeah. Yeah, and that's real theory. So in your working mm -hmm. memory, as you're watching me speak now, as I say, you have a sort of 20 second attention span as we flow through it. 
And then right. you can only hold two or three things in your mind at one time. Right. So right. If, if I said to you, here are the cities in Scotland, you know, they are Aberdeen, Dundee, Inverness, Glasgow, and Edinburgh. Right, you tell Aberdeen, me what I'm just Dundee, saying. I'm Aberdeen, Dundee, Glasgow. Okay, I didn't get that. Yeah, <laughs> that no, goes no, three. That's exactly it. Because working memory can hold about three things at the same time. Right. You're proof there, George, of the theory. Right. And right. we're all like that. So that your mind can only manipulate and hold two or three things in, in, in mind in one time, which is right. why we can calculate seven plus four equals 11. But if right. I said to you, what is 113 and multiply it by 110, it would take you a while <laughs> because working memory can't hold it. So, yeah, and that's why we need these things. Exactly. So I think this whole notion of understanding working memory and, and the way around this is to make your brain work hard to embed that knowledge. OK, right. So, right. you know, I, I can tell you, you know, all the kings and queens of England, all 40 of them. And I can give you all the dates and that because I've made the effort to remember it because I like history. You know. <laughs> But you have to make the effort. And this is an eternal truth in learning that we often forget. We, we design courses to give the illusion of learning because they're too easy. Right, right. Information, information, and they mix up with information with knowledge as well. So, yeah. yeah. And how about coaching? Well, coaching, what worries, coaching has come out again historically out of the psychoanalytic tradition of coaching, mentoring, and counseling. The idea that you need another person always to give you advice. Mm -hmm. And I've never, I, I personally have, would admit, I've never had a coach or mentor ever in my entire life. In fact, I think I've benefited from not having a coach or mentor because I, I, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I, I really believe this. I've never joined a club. I've never been part of an institute because I think it's good to have independence of thought, you know, to free yourself right. from the chains. I don't want just somebody else who thinks they know something to tell me what they know. I want to be an independent thinker myself. However, coaching can be very, very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, coaching, my son is a, an athlete. He does Taekwondo, uh, mm -hmm. the martial art. And he is yep. in the England team. He's a very high level sports person. He was in the England national team. Really? And, England and he, national and team. I've learned a lot. Yeah. So he, I, I've learned a lot from him because he's had coaches, you know, in sport, which have helped him enormously. But that coaching is very sophisticated with very strong feedback, tiny right. incremental improvements on performance. Most coaching in L&D is like a chat, you know? <laughs> and I'm not too sure that, I think it makes people feel good. Yeah. I'm not wholly convinced at times that it has real efficacy, you know, given the time. This is why I prefer technological, technological solutions. Right. And we've been looking at chatbots, for example, as an alternative to mentoring and coaching. Mm -hmm. So there's a very famous example in Georgia Tech where they had nine teaching assistants on the course, 350 students. They swapped one of the teaching assistants out for a chatbot mm -hmm. and none of the students noticed that it was a piece of software. Noticed, right, right. In fact, they put it out for a teaching award. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's because it was consistent. It gave them exact, you know, it... it when they sent an email to the chatbot, it gave them an, an immediate answer, whereas the faculty member would take a day or two days to respond. In fact, they had to slow it down. They had to put a delay in to make it look as though a human being was typing it. So I think we're in a phase where it may be that technology solves some of these problems because the problem with coaching is it's not scalable. You yeah. know, and I would much but rather capture the expertise of a, you know, if someone's right. been, Experience really does matter, you know. I think I would much rather capture the experience of a really valued employee in technology and then apply that through technology. Yeah. I think I think this is the way to go because uh, experience is most of the time it is individualized, is personalized. I mean, yeah. uh, pertain to captured to oneself. Um, yeah. But if technology can kind of uh, you know extract it and then put on a platform and you know, different channels and share with more people and then who need it. And then that experience, it really become experience. Otherwise it's just some feelings and personal experiences. When you leave the job, you carry it away <laughs> to another company or with you. That's why artificial intelligence is personalizing learning. You know, you a coach personalizes the experience. Right. 
right. but we now have right. very smart technology that can personalize every learning experience for you as an individual right. and that's where it's it, going have you heard the term incidental learning uh when you mentioned earlier in, uh, formal and informal learning here and then I, I i i absolutely came up that word remind me incidental learning and that's yeah. very big uh from uh the uh, University of uh, Columbia University, uh, Dr. Victoria Marsic, and also uh, Karen Wat Watkins. Uh, Karen uh, uh, Watkins, and uh, she is in the professor at uh, uh, University of Georgia, also of Georgia. Yeah. Well, they are. The they have been writing pals for thirty years now, so they they are very big in incidental learning. Too. See, so that, I think the incidental learning thing is interesting and it's on the right path, but I think it's slight. I have one major problem with the incidental learning theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that I, I have a there's another theory that sits alongside it, and, and mm -hmm. it's called moments of need theory. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was in, incidental theory is a bit like micro learning, and always you respond in the moment, you know, to whatever you know a demand there is for that particular. To solve that particular problem right right but bob mosher uh, i don't know if you've heard of bob mosher uh, he wrote a very interesting book in which he identified the five major moments of need and i think this mm. is an, a richer theory so if you're mm. in the workplace you either need to know something like i'm going to have to interview for a new employee tomorrow so that's a uh -huh. moment you know an immediate i need to know how to interview properly give me a catch-up or a job aid or right. it may it may be a brand new skill you have to acquire yeah, I really need to know this stuff. I need to go on a course. But there are five major moments in need. I, I won't go into the detail in them. I think mm -hmm. that's a slightly richer theory because it looks at demand and not supply. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this is all good. I think this is all heading in the right direction because the AI technology that I've been building and LXP platforms like Stream and Waves from Learning right. Pro, the, this is delivering the incidental learning to people when they need it at the moment of need. Right. And by and large, that's more informal. It's more of a process than an event. So these right. are all good people doing very, very good work. I agree. Right. Right. The reason I want I, why I asked uh, action learning and uh, micro learning and also coaching, because they're so big in China. Yeah. I mean, big. Uh, my, my general I guess my general question is all these learning theories in 2,500 years of, of learning theories and also, you know, all the fads and but China still uh, some some of them are China still in it. Those fads are not completely go away and won't completely go away because China is such a huge country and it's imbalanced. I mean, it, it needs balance from coastal cities to inland cities, tier ones to tier twos, tier threes and tier five, fours and fives. So there are so many layers of the development. So different different development stages and those prob those things that America or the rest of the Western world has gone through probably. China has to go through it again. But yeah. do you think, my question to you is, do you think we can accelerate, cut, make a shortcut, so avoid to paying those prices that we, the United States or UK or other countries, Western developed countries have gone through? Yes, I, and the answer to that is yes. And let me explain why I think it will happen. Mm -hmm. So China has, has, at the government level, very deliberately promoted AI as its major technological push uh, and right. it has very clear targets, very clear budgets. And I think China is more likely to adopt AI in the learning field than, uh, than us here in Europe uh, or even in America. And there's a good example of a company called Squirrel. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're very active in the K-12 field in China. And they What's use called? quite advanced uh, learning analytics, personalized learning in the school system. So I think China, if, chi if China took artificial intelligence as seriously in education and learning as they have in areas of business, then you, right. China has a chance of leaping ahead uh, of the West in that sense, because you've already spent good money in the R&D side, that's all happening in China. It's happening right. in business with logistics and autom automated control, robotics and so on. Wow. But it's a matter of bringing it down into the learning world. And that will happen in universities, but more importantly, I think in China, it will happen in the school system. So I think you, I think China, the short cut is two letters, A and I. A because that, I. all the good things we've been talking about, about active learning, personalization mm -hmm. of learning, the replacing mm -hmm. of coaching with actually a really personalized experience that's akin to a course, all of that can be delivered using AI. You know, I have in the corner of this room, 
my Alexa, A-L-E-X-A, -E uh, you know, from Amazon. And I can ask her a question using voice and she replies. And I use Alexa every day. Uh, yeah. You know, I have an automatic robot that cleans up my house. You know, it comes and sweeps up all the dust. Yeah. Yeah. I live yeah. in the world of voice and AI. Yeah. Whenever yeah. you use social media, it's mediated by AI. If you buy yeah. something on Amazon uh, yeah. or buy that, you know, it or whatever is. system, it is mediated by AI. It uh, is. If you use it Google is. or Google Scholar, mediated by AI. So all of our, everything we do online is mediated by AI, except for learning at the moment, but that will come. So how, my next question, big question is we finally come to AI and content uh, automation and uh, also learning. So how does AI help learning? Okay, well, what, what it, there are several layers to this. If we go across the learning journey from, you know, right. Right, the first thing is it changes the interface. So I now interface with technology using voice and that, so text to speech, speech it speaks back to me. That's pure AI, okay? Right. That's the first thing. So it's, it's revolution, making it frictionless. Most teachers mm -hmm. speak by voice. You know, you wouldn't go into a lecture hall and see a lecturer just drop on the board and not say anything. It would be bizarre. <laughs> Yet most of your learning is like that. You know, it's text and graphics. So I think it's revolutionizing the interface. That's point mm -hmm. one. The right. second point is around this learning objectives thing and engagement. How do you engage people in learning? Now, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, the first thing I do when I wake up is look at my smartphone and I'm on social media. That's engagement. Right. I'm engaged with social media. As right, is every other right. person on the planet. I do too. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you look at a young person in China, uh, right. in uh, India, in the United States or Europe, they do this every morning. The first thing they do. So we can learn a lot. And they all use AI as a form of engaging people. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. The second thing is learning support. And AI is particularly good at this. I gave the example at Georgia Tech of giving people support as they go through a learning experience through adaptive or personalized learning. This is really happening. So I've been involved in the build of a big adaptive learning system, which is personalized learning. If you, you know, if you make a mistake, it knows you've made a mistake and gets you back on course. A bit like the sat nav or GPS in your car. The AI mm -hmm. is acting like the sat nav. And if you, if you go off course, you get back on course again using an intelligent tutor. That works mm -hmm. beautifully well. And of course, also an assessment even well-being, there are chatbots that do the well-being stuff, you know, and mental health and so on. So right across the whole learning journey, learning engagement, learning support, I've been using uh, I've been using AI to build online learning content. You know, you send me a PowerPoint, a document, a video, I put it into the wildfire system, I press a button, and it creates the content. And sophisticated content, you know, where you're typing in open input and it's semantically interpreting your answer, you know? Uh, that, that sort of stuff. AI is giving us these wonderful tools, and yet we're stuck in an old multiple choice, old e-learning model of making it just media based. So coming back to your original question about China, I think China have a significant push and budgets, a, a sort of push in society to use AI that in the West, also I think in China, there's less obsession with some of the you know, the ethical concerns because China is a, a very, so, you know, as you know, a, a social a Confucian context. In other words, it's not about you as an individual, it's about your role in contributing to society as a whole. And that's what AI does, you know, it aggregates data from everyone for the benefit right. of the right. individual. Collectivism, yeah. That's right. I think China's, funnily enough, has a, a cultural context for AI that's quite different from the individualist culture in the West. And you know right. both quite well, George, and you know exactly what I mean here. It, exactly. It's, it's very difficult. Wearing mask, this pandemic, where the mask, controlling the pandemic is, is a typical example of the differences of uh, individualism and con collectivism. And China uh, very effectively contained the virus. And now, it's, you know, all the data shows. And now America nearly, you know, gosh. Yes, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Wearing yeah. masks is so difficult in, in, yeah. in the state, in the UK. And the, it's also quite interesting to see what happened in the pandemic in education because the Chinese government actually did some preparation in 2018, actually, around online learning, if such a thing happened, and managed, right. because there was a more, collective, a more collective push to solve that problem, they just got right. on with it and did it quite well compared to the mess that we experienced in Europe and the US on, on this. Right. Uh, right. The teachers were ill-prepared. Nobody expected this to happen. But so you have... China responded right. well there. 
So this is a million dollar question. If you, because you have come down from history, I mean, I just followed with you in the time machine from 2,500 years ago until today. Now we're seeing like, uh, we, we come through and now time travel and now we're here into 2021. Now we're like, we, we, we look across, there's the United States, there's the UK, there's China, there's you know, big countries. So if China wanted to make that shortcut and take that leap, what China needs to do in what, like, give me three aspects, like theoretical studies or investments. What, what are the three most thing, important things to realize AI in learning? Okay. Well, I think the first thing is that you, you know, have a look at, I mean, I've written a book. Uh, they're very, there's very little, li because it's so new, we don't have the... the right, right. So there's a research layer here. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've tried to summarize in my book, uh, you know, uh, so this, you know, the, the, the AI for Learning book is quite a substantial right. series book. And that gives you the almost like a bedrock for this. But I think in China, you will need a literature around AI for Learning, you know, and some spokespeople for it. But that's happening. I would strongly recommend you look at this company, Squirrel, They because uh, they have presented in Europe, and I've met the chief executive of that company here in Berlin. They are quite advanced on this front, and the technology they have is exactly the same technology as I've been using in my AI company. Squirrel, so, like the little squirrel. animal squirrel? I like the small animal squirrel, yeah. they. Uh, I don't know what the Chinese word is, obviously, but if uh, I'll send you a link, George, and you can uh, have a look at them. Please, yeah. I think that's the first thing. And I think China... the. China has an opportunity here because, you know, when China decides to do something, it does it. <laughs> if America decides to do it, they may do it, but a lot of people don't want to do it <laughs> because of that individualistic culture. So if China took the technology seriously, and I think they will, they already are. I mean, if, you know, the good thing about China is you didn't go the American way. You've built your own technology. So Badai, Tencent, Alibaba, you know, these... These are huge, massive global companies, but they're homegrown. They're Chinese companies. And so, you know, the, these companies already are very advanced in terms of the research. The research in AI is by and large being done in the context of Bad Eye Tencent. You know, they know what they're doing and they have some of the world leading software in this area, along with the Americans. But you have your own. And I think if China took that magic dust, that AI, advantage that you have and applied it in learning because you do you can do things on a national scale and china is so big uh, you could really have a, a almost a gear change a leap forward as opposed to i think china in the phase that you rightly put it in a sense is mimicking america you know taking american theory some of it faddish some of it old some of it not particularly appropriate um, especially for chinese culture and i think there's a chance here of breaking that bond, you know, and saying, well, no, we have our own view of the world, that, that more right. collective view, and this technology fits this model. Right. Because what it does is it, it takes data from the many and applies it to the few. Right. That's what artificial intelligence does. And that's entirely in line with Chinese culture. You know, mm. the many working for the, the you know, the, the, the social good is the goal mm -hmm. and not the individual. So, I think AI has a culturally the right context in China, but you know I, I would hope it also would ho also happen in America as well because they're good at this as well. The Americans, the American tech companies, know know exactly what they're doing. All of these companies, you know, the top ten companies by market cap are Chinese mm -hmm. and American, and I've just given you them. There's 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 four or five in China and four or five in America. They're all AI companies, every single one of them. <laughs> you know, but I is an AI company. Tencent is an AI company. So right. it, it would be foolish of us in learning if we're looking at technology to solve problems and scale learning. It would be foolish of us to ignore AI because it does some wonderful things. What uh, I want to wrap up our, uh, I know your time is, you have a hard hit, uh, hard stop. Uh, in, I mean, excuse me, uh, hard, hard stop. So in, uh, if you had a chance to start all over again, what would you have done differently? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it. I like that question. Well, Plan you know, A? <laughs> yeah, no, well, see, when, when I was younger, I suppose I would describe myself as a risk taker. You know, I left, you know, I, I, I remember when I was 16, I took off from home and went off and traveled on, on my own. I left home at 17, you know, and uh, I've traveled all over the world in some very dangerous places like Syria and so on. 
So I, I've always been a risk taker, but I suppose if I had to live my life again, I would take even more risks, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I think, I think fear is a really big and dangerous emotion, you know, and it holds most people back. If anything, uh, you know, I'm 64 years old now, and if I had my life again, I, I'm sure I would do things differently, but my life has been a series of chance events anyway. It was never planned. But I think I would take even more risks than I took financially, mentally, geographically, and so on. Right. Thank you. So the advice to the young people is, think about that. <laughs> That's a good yeah. advice. <laughs> also, Do something also, while you're young. <laughs> also, is that you, you asked the question about advice, you know, and yeah, that's my next question. Thing, my, yeah. Yeah. my piece of advice would be don't take advice from people. They, <laughs> they, 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 they're as full of fear as you. And they don't let other people mold your future, you know. And I was avoid advice. <laughs> <laughs> Think about the problems deeply yourself and make your own decision. You know, I can't tell you how many times people have told me to do X and Y and Z. And if I had done X, Y and Z, it would have not led to a good outcome. Because people want to live their lives through you. You know, your parents want to mold you. Your teachers want to mold you. Your university professors want to mold you. But you then you think, well, well, why are you a teacher and a university professor? You're not, you know, like, you're not in the real world in a sense. So be very careful about advice, I would say, and right. before accepting it as the truth. And always think deeply about what you think, you know. Yeah. Think yeah. deeply about problems. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. This, this session is really, this interview is truly uh, inspirational, truly knowledge, I mean, knowledge packed, <laughs> very inten intensive, uh, as I mean, dense and uh, flow of knowledge. And this is a, a fantastic time travel and I'm a gentleman yeah. time machine. Thank you for yeah, the 2,500 sure. years of uh, travel <laughs> learning theories. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we're coming up today. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We really did travel over 2,500. Yeah, and all was, those uh, advice that you get. And also the last advice were the younger, younger generations is think twice on advices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. This is uh, most of the, uh, your, the research. I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, your opinions and your uh, point of view perspectives are really mind blowing to most of us. But I think it is necessary because yeah, uh, I just as like the last point you made. Be careful about the vices, and I think the point is being a free spirit, being independent thinker, and what you think. So what what do you want to do? What are you interested? In? What are your curiosities are? So what drives you from the inner you, <laughs> inner ego? So I mean, so be a free spirit. I think that's what you mean. And thank you so much for the, all these mind blowing, uh, inspirational and inspiring ideas. I mean, ideas really works. This world is driven by ideas and our future yeah. driven by ideas, driven by AI, AI is an idea. So and it's, it's really wonderful that technology allows us to discuss, you know, from opposite sides of the planet, we're talking about computers. <laughs> yes. You know, that is a really wonderful thing, you know, and uh, I think we do it so readily now and forget how amazing this is, you know, that we can we can be on the other side of the planet and discuss right, right, in this very right. intimate fashion uh, right. the ideas that we all want to share. It's uh, it's always a quite a nice, it's a, I find it a really cathartic and interesting experience, especially when I speak to people like you, George, from, from another culture, you know. Right, right. But, uh, it's, it's enlightening, really. It is, it is. Thank you so much, Don, Donald. And uh, I really appreciate, on behalf of all the viewers, thank you again. And uh, I know you're, you're, you have, uh, but uh, we, we do want, want to hear more from you. And uh, okay. so we will, we'll keep in touch. We'll learn okay. more from you. And <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure. Take care. Take care bye and bye. stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you very much. And the same to you, George. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. That's my interview with Donald Clark. I feel, how do you feel? I feel it's a very packed session because during our interview just now, he walked us through, walked us through in 25 minutes, the 2,500 years of learning history. There's a lot of names, a lot of uh, uh, theories and gosh, 
It's very intense. I would like to invite you back to watch this episode again and again. Thank you, Dong. Uh, thank you, Dong, for your abundance of knowledge and thank you for sharing with us. And also during our interview, he also debunked a few learning myths for us, like what uh, Dr. Clark Quain did previously. Thank you again, Donald Clark, and we hope that in the future we can learn more from you and we look forward to hearing from you more. Thank you. Next week, we are going to have another guru from the practice world to share with us their best practices. Their best practices. His name is David James, also from the United Kingdom. He used to be the chief learning officer of Disney, EMEA. EMEA stands for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. He's very, very experienced. And now he set up his own company called Loop, L-O-O-O-P. It's an e-learning company and he has many other, uh, he has several other titles and uh, responsibilities. During our next week's interview, we're gonna ask him a lot of questions around e-learning. How do we use e-learning to more efficiently develop talents? And especially how should we engage, keep the learners engaged and also how do we keep all these target audience engaged from the very beginning to the end how do we empower them etc cetera, etc cetera. so until next week please stay safe stay tuned thank you and good night <laughs>